Hi, my name's Dave Adams, you're watching The Core Mechanic, and today we're looking at number 22 on Mike Selinker's list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play, Carcassonne. Hi, my name's Dave Adams, and I love playing games. At the 2015 PAX convention, one of my favourite game designers, Mike Selinka, presented his list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. The 100th game on the list was a challenge to play a game of my own design. With a desire to understand more about the hobby that I love so much, I've taken on that challenge to design a game, but first I need to learn as much as I can about game design. I'm going to start by playing as many of the games on Mike's list as possible. Join me as I learn more about the core mechanic. Carcassonne was designed by Klaus Jürgen Werder, who's also known for designing the game The Downfall of Pompeii. It was designed in 2000, and then in 2001, Carcassonne won the very prestigious Spiel des Jahres Award, which is handed out at the Spiel Convention in Germany, which is the world's largest board gaming convention. Also happens to be a bit of a dream of mine to get to one day. The game itself can hold between two to five players, it plays in about 45 minutes, and in English, it was produced by Rio Grande Games. Each game will have a scoring board, a set of followers, a set of tiles, and a starting tile. The starting tile is identifiable by the different colored back. Each game starts by taking the starting tile and placing it down whatever direction you choose. The first person takes their starting tile and places it in an appropriate spot that connects well to the other tiles. So that could be farmland to farmland, it could be road to road, or in other cases it might be castle to castle. You place your follower down, and then when you fully connected or fully fulfilled the spot, you'll take your person back and score your points. And farms are scored only at the end. Carcassonne is named after a French town, which is well known today for the many ruins of castles that lie within its gates. Which kind of works in with the theme of Carcassonne of uh, trying to build this city around all of these different castles. However, I think the game Carcassonne is a little bit more well known for the development and creation of this little guy. The meeple. The rules don't actually use the term meeple. It uses the word follower. And even today, 16 years after the word was popularized in 2000, it still calls them followers. Meeple came into popularity when it was used by David Benazzini in an SSG discussion, which I'll try and provide the links to at the bottom. Now, he was referring to one of his friends, Allison, who was teaching him the game, and he believes it was in reference to, or some sort of combination of the word, my people. Regardless of what it was, and regardless of whoever Allison Hensel is, the word has come into ubiquitous use today. Now, Carcassonne owns the rights to the, to the meeple shape, but not the meeple name. Some people actually refute that story, uh, believing that the word meeple was used in an earlier game, published not that long beforehand, called La Cita, which I'll also try and put a link to at the bottom, because I'm not 100% sure I'm actually saying the names correctly. Now, Mike puts... Carcassonne on the list saying that few games do tile lane better. He pairs it with Settlers of Catan, which we'll look at at a later date. Carcassonne really does have some key elements that make it such a playable game, but also one that's endured for the last 16 years. Since 2000, there's been a significant number of uh, expansions and, re and, I suppose, sort of remakes with different themes and different versions, and I'm just going to list some of them right here. So as you can see, there's quite a few expansions, remakes, rethemings, and after 16 years, people just don't seem to have had enough of it yet. And that speaks really well of the game. In fact, it probably means that there's quite a lot we can take away from this. Designers say that seem to suggest that it's not 
when you can't add anything more to a game that it's finished, it's when you can't take anything else away. And it's that simplicity in design. It's when you've got it down to just the mechanics that you need, just the gameplay elements that you need, that I think makes it accessible and replayable for a lot of people. In Carcassonne, you're really only doing a couple of things, but you're engaging in two really strong core mechanics. Now your tile laying, so you're picking up a tile and you're playing it every turn, but on the scale over the course of the whole game, you're actually playing an area control game. So you're using your resources, you've got your meeples, and you're choosing when to put them down, and you're trying to find ways of collecting them back, in, but at the same time you're trying to take possession of these castles, and you're trying to take possessions of these roads, and you're trying to take possessions of farming land. And this leads to a multiple or multiplicity of decision making that goes on over the course of the game, each of which is always uncertain and always in flux, and really requires good tactical decision making to try and swing the game around to your ultimate victory. Now some of the problems that you might run into as a player is actually running out of meeples. There's been many times in which I've fought ardently over castles or I've invested over heavily into farming land and then I've been left in a position where I'm not actually taking back any of my meeples and scoring anything and I'm just sitting there trying to place tiles desperately hoping to find the tile that I can use to collect a meeple back or a couple of meeples back and start getting back into the action and scoring again. Unfortunately, if I'm not smart enough, which has happened on a few occasions, I can get lost in the game, I can lose all my meeples. However, also doing small amounts of very quick, sharp uh, point scoring, like a little road here and a little castle there, often isn't enough to earn you enough victory points over the course of the game. So you really have to try and fight hard over getting those bigger castles, uh, trying to get those longer roads, trying to have just enough farming area that you've taken possession of the castles in that area and you score the big points at the end. I think as a designer, some of those things that I would like to consider having played the game is firstly, that ability to know the mechanics well enough to use them in such a way that they, they're not convoluted or they're not working in conflict with each other, but that one naturally progresses to the other. The way it works the mechanics in with the conceit of trying to take possession of castles or trying to take possession of, of the town of Carcassonne all works really well. Of course we're trying to build the town but we're also trying to take away its resources and so the conceit works in really well with the mechanics. But the mechanics aren't in conflict. In fact, they all work really smoothly together to help create a good gameplay experience. But it's also that consideration of small tactical decisions, long-term strategy, and the state of play at any one time. Now, heuristically, I can look at the board and see where I am scoring, and positionally, I can try and think in terms of what I need to do to fix that, but sometimes that's harder to do than just simply going, oh, well, I'll, I'll make these decisions because at any one time you don't really know what the next tile is. Some people might consider that reducing the bushiness of the decision making, but at the same time, it also adds to the flux of play. It creates a bit of suspense. It uh, helps you, it sort of builds that tension of, can I get what I need or, or can I somehow creatively use what I have to find a different strategy or to, to shift my gameplay and still try and come out with some optimal scoring. And it's the person who's really flexible in gameplay that can make that happen. I think it builds tension well uh, as you start to use your pieces and you can see the score progressing and yet at the same time it, because you've got the farmers you don't ultimately know what the big score is going to be and sometimes there's been times where I've dead set certain that I've lost and I've come through with the victory. I think it's those small surprises, uh, that what use of information that makes a difference. Well, thanks for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts below. I'm Dave Adams, and you've been watching The Core Mechanic.